You're in the hospital, everything moving fast, but really it's like your clock is slow. The doctors know you're responsible. You drop a drum, but you lost control. Model, hot, hot, the low. Stop silence and watch you. Cops are close, you're not composed. Highs are close. Your life flashes. Highs and lows. Fucking car crashes. Time is broke. Five standards on the road. Everybody's in silent mode. You make the scene, seem like a main attraction. Pain and passion from a chain reaction. Cause you really live in the density. Never seeing the truth in life. Never think you're Former cynical views became a vision of truth. Consistent abuse is a condition in you. Your last speech was a waste, they don't listen to you. A couple words got the mind, the collision the two. When they're given the shoes, what they consider the rules? Cause the speech that they heard doesn't limit the rules. You can give them the tools, you're never given the credit. So they back in that cell with these criminal tenants. You gotta get it and it's dead. It's a minimal sentence. But that burden is a light that you're serving a night. It can serve in the light. And while you're nervously bright, you're telling kids what they hate. You fight for that person you like when you live in the past and you consider the crash a mistake that you made that you'll never get past Of what was going on. 
My oldest son is a Kingston police officer. My youngest son is a Boston EMS medic. And my daughter works at South Shore Hospital. And every night over weekend or in weekends, I would hear about more and more tragedies and how accelerated the rate of those tragedies were happening. So it was last September or October, I guess, we ran our first bunk floor. And our misfortune was it landed on the same night as the opening game of the Red Sox World Series. So not expecting more than a dozen people, we were shocked when we had over 200 people. Just lost my son. Um, it became crystal clear then, in October, that parents were very concerned about this epidemic. As I traveled through my six town district, I listened to fire chiefs, and I listened to parents. And the, chiefs, the fire chiefs would tell us they weren't prepared, in many cases, to administer Narcan. Police chiefs told us they were understaffed and unprepared to find the bad guys within their borders. And you can see this thing growing, like a ball of fire, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and parents becoming more and more and more concerned. So that's why we decided to run this this evening here in Plymouth North High School. So that parents can have and gain the tools, the perspective you need to know the assault that our children are under right now. Starting from what's in your refrigerators and in your medicine cabinets, right up through what is uh, available to our kids on the street and by way of the internet. It's a whole new world I've learned about in the past six months. It's not a world any of us choose to know about. It's not something we would have chosen to be the agenda at our kitchen tables. But it's something that has to be an agenda item at all of our kitchen tables. So this evening, our goal in the next two hours is to empower each of you with the tools that are needed by way of information to be able to work with your children and even your adult children. And it's so important, so critically important, that we have some very straight talk based upon good information. And it begins here, it begins now, and when you leave here, my hope, my prayer for you is you have some of the tools that you need to fight this fight. And together we'll win, and we'll talk about that this evening. Our focus tonight is on prevention. Uh, and if we can prevent even one child, it's worth all, from, from getting involved with drugs, it's worth all our time coming out here tonight. So before we begin the, pro begin the program, I'd ask my dear friend, Dr. Maestas, to come up and join me at the rostrum, and he's going to give some brief remarks before we start our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to take a moment of silence for the loss of one of our public police officers, uh, Fred Maloney, who was lost in the line of duty today. So uh, please, let's take a moment of silence. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, and Virginia can actually, uh, it's out on the internet. Um, our students are concerned about uh, what they're seeing out in the community. And I, I think tonight is going to give you uh, an inside view of some of the things that uh, we can do to help prevent or just be aware of some of the issues that are out there. So um, I'm grateful for everyone uh, being here tonight. And uh, before we leave tonight, we have a survey that we'd like for you to um, fill out if you could. And the survey is actually going to look for information uh, for future opportunities to um, bring forums and things of that nature around this topic or other topics that will help our community uh, to make a difference in the lives of children. So I want to thank you all for attending and I'm going to turn it back over to you. Before I uh, begin with our panelists, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize two dear friends uh, from the legislature who are extraordinary leaders and, and, and represent this area so, so well. My friend Dave Gimzito and Representative Josh Cutler. <laughs> our first speaker, see if I can get this out clearly. Uh, I was afraid last night as I was reading this agenda, I wouldn't be able to pronounce her last name. And she helped me with that today. Uh, Tracy, watch your house key. It's watch your house key. She said, describe it as watch your house key. Uh, <laughs> Regional Director of Student Assistance Programs, Karen Treatment Centers. In her role with Karen, uh, Tracy Travis Lothian is presenting this information regularly. She was here at Plymouth North talking to students just a short time ago. Tracy? <coughs> students all over uh, five states and um, 
I think more, more kids are making good choices around drugs and alcohol. It's definitely an issue, and again, that's why I'm thrilled to be here tonight, to see people come out to take the issue seriously, so it needs to be addressed. But there are um, a lot of young people who are making good decisions, which is important to know. Well, it might be everything tonight that I touch. Yeah, it should, it should be on. Good news. This is from a Monitoring the Future survey. Unfortunately, there hadn't been I, uh, you know, sur a lot of survey uh, data recently for, for this area, but I just thought some national data would help frame the presentation. Um, the good news is alcohol use has been on the uh, decline, um, although it's still the most widely uh, abused drug by teens. About 11% of uh, people under the age of 21 access are drinking the, uh, the alcohol in our country. So that, that's important to note. Um, but that has gone down a lot. Inhaling abuse has been on the decline as well. Um, still, you know, it's, it's always been an issue that we, we're, we should talk about, and we're going to talk about some household items of concern. And synthetic marijuana, which had been a big concern, some of that K2 or spice, has, uh, we've seen a decline nationally. Where we need to really you know, focus a lot of our efforts are on some um, uh, pre prescription medications like Adderall, uh, which for, is for ADD, ADHD, um, it's a medication that students are abusing, often as a study drug. Marijuana, which I don't think is a big surprise, the way in Massachusetts that, that there should be, um, it's a, a, that's a big item of concern right now. And then prescription drugs uh, and things like ecstasy as well. So I get asked all the time, why do, uh, why do kids use drugs. And there's a bunch of reasons up, up there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Experimentation, um, to, to, you know, to feel different. A lot of it is they, they don't know. Um, there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. So that, that's important that we get them correct information. We get them the facts. Uh, the feeling that everyone's doing it. Um, I hear that all the time. I was, in, I was doing a support group this morning and the students were saying, well, everybody does that. Um, and we know that that's not true. Um, there, are, you know, there may be a drug that a lot of people are engaging in, but not everybody's doing it. Um, the big reason is for, for students is um, that they work. They, they do all of these things. So that's where the prevention uh, side of it comes in. We really need to, to find a way to you know, explain, hey, I know that these things are happening. They're using it for coping skills, uh, more than just for fun, just so you know. More of them are using them for coping skills. But that's, that's where our, our role is, is to have these conversations with them. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about alcohol. Uh, one of the, the uh, things to note is that there's a lot of trends around alcohol right now. Uh, binge drinking, which is four or five drinks in a sitting in a one or two hour period, is pretty significant. We're seeing a lot of issues around that. And teens don't even realize it's binge drinking when you ask them. Um, you'll ask them if they binge drink, and they'll say no. And then when you define it, they, they often are like, oh, okay, yeah, I have done that before. Um, drinking games. I went to find Jenga. You probably all heard of Jenga on Amazon. And before I even found Jenga, I found something called Drunken Towers, which is a drinking game. And just disturbing to me to go, I travel to the south a lot, um, and I know they have them here as well, but I went into a, I think it was a Rite Aid or a store near a college, and they had the red Solo cups, the red plastic cups, with the ping pong balls in them. So it was, it was beer pong packaged, so that the people could come in and just buy that right away. Um, you know, it's just really disturbing to me that that was just made available um, to people. Pre-gaming is drinking before they go out, so a lot of um, adolescents will do that so that they're intoxicated before they even get to a social event. The alcohol pop drinks, those are the things like the Twisted Teas and the Mike's Hard Lemonade, and I don't think this would be a surprise that those are very appealing to adolescents because of the flavoring of them. Many of them, um, they say you know, between 40 and 50% um, of 14 to 18 year olds have tried those. Um, 
energy drinks, mixing with energy drinks. I know there was a lot of press around that for loco. Um, they had done a lot of press around things like the Four Loco, and um, it was an energy drink mixed with alcohol, and they took it off the market and uh, changed the formula a little bit. But really things like, thank you, um, Red Bull and vodka are still something that students talk about a lot. Uh, we actually did a study at Karen looking at some um, online chats that um, in public forums that kids were having and any time they talked about drugs or alcohol we sort of got my heart and i will say red, red bull and vodka came up a lot um, pocket shots i haven't seen them sold around here but they were marketed online they're like capri sun for alcohol and their tagline has something to do with if you like your alcohol on the go I mean, I'm not sure if you were going for a jog and then having some rum at the end. I'm not quite sure. Um, my sense is that it's probably for sporting events um, and things like that, but it could be easily concealed um, because they can just roll up the package afterwards. Um, mixing prescription drugs uh, with, with alcohol is obviously a huge concern for the overdose potential. Boozy bears are the gummy bears that are soaked in vodka. And I actually went to a one-year-old's um, birthday party, and they had a candy theme, and so, which is weird because the one-year-old couldn't even eat candy, but whatever, no judgment there. Um, they, next to, the, they had all the children's candy, and then they had a section of adult candy. And there was a big bowl of these gummy bears soaked in vodka. And I kept watching the adults go over and take huge scoops. Like some of them I don't think really knew. I mean, they figured it out pretty quickly, but, um, and some went back repeatedly. But I, I was concerned about, you know, these people are leaving on one birthday party and driving home. So that was a concern for me. Um, alcohol, um, they, they had some, there were some YouTube videos about eyeball shots that people were doing, um, putting alcohol, like vodka, in their eye, and then, losing um, sight in their eye. Uh, smoking alcohol has been on, there's been a lot of videos about that, and um, Snoop Dogg was even on a show recently called The League, and he was smoking alcohol. Um, they, they just heat it in these contraptions, and they can also do it with a bicycle pump. Um, hand sanitizer, which we don't see very often, but if they do abuse it, it could be in a two ounce bottle of hand sanitizer, it could be like four shots of vodka. So um, it's horribly, it doesn't taste good, but they, if someone wanted to ingest alcohol, they could. And then Dirty Sprite, which is, um, I haven't, again, heard from it around here, but if I've heard it other places, there's a chance that it will get out, and there's rap songs about it, so the kids have heard the, what Dirty Sprite is, and it's a mixture of an anti-nausea medication called promethazine, um, uh, some spray, uh, then they, they, add, they can add different pills to it, uh, Jolly Ranchers, and they let it sit, and they drink it. So thank you. Um, just quickly, just some tobacco card trends. Uh, we see that our oh, cigarettes, we've done a great job, and this is, I think, an important uh, message to get across. When we talk about a lot of the, the items of concern, the drugs that are, are out there and our children are being exposed to, you know, tobacco for such a long time, the rates were so high, and, and we saw, you know, 25, 30% of kids under the age of 18 using. It's now it's under 16% in Massachusetts. So we've done a really good job with it. So I know that we could do that with other things. It doesn't, it's, you know, we, we just really took that initiative on and made some uh, huge changes. Uh, the things that are a concern are still cigars, uh, things called hookahs. They actually have, I don't know if you have a hookah bar in the area, but in a lot of college uh, towns, Boston has a lot of them, um, and they're contraptions that they can smoke um, tobacco out of, but other things as well. Um, electronic cigarettes have sort of come to the forefront, and some of the dangers that they're now um, really wondering uh, that may come along with those. Um, dissolvable products, which they could put, um, they're made of nicotine, they could put on their tongues, they look like Tic Tacs, are an issue. Um, just a few things about uh, marijuana. Uh, again, huge concern for our, our young people in Massachusetts. Our rates for marijuana are, are pretty significant um, compared to the national average. So these are just a few ways that they use.
utilize them. I think many people have heard of joints, or bowls, or pipes. Uh, the new thing is they're called one hitters or bats, uh, and they can they're very transportable. They can just keep filling those and, and smoking out of them. Vape pens are another uh, product that has sort of taken off, and the, the price ranges, but the kids, once they get a hold of these, um, they basically have a little vaporizer in them. Um, so they could be 50, 100, 200, 300 dollars, but they can use it repeatedly um, for marijuana. Uh, bongs, blunts are cigars that they take the, they have blunt wraps and then the cigars, they take the actual tobacco out of it, but the outside is tobacco as well. They have jewelry that can turn into a pipe. Uh, they call it hookah jewelry usually. And then edibles, things like brownies, candies, there's all kinds that are out there. Uh, and then finally, dabbing. Dabbing is a new phenomenon that we have just heard of. Um, where marijuana doesn't really have, you know, like a fatal overdose potential, this, where a worry, um, could have some, some real dangers around it. They burn marijuana at a very high level with things like butane, and then they smoke that vapor, which is very concentrated, um, and people have had some uh, severe problems with that. So just a few more things. Um, marijuana is, is to, to a lot of students, what the problem is, is they, they see it as sort of a benign drug. It's, they don't, the perceived risk has gone down significantly. And as the perceived risk goes down, the actual um, use uh, goes up. And uh, we've seen that with other drugs as well. So they did, did a lot of research. They found that it doubled the risk of car crashes. They have recently found a link to testicular cancer. Um, reduction in IQ up to eight points was a study that just came out in 2012. Uh, a link to mental illness, schizophrenia, uh, depression, anxiety, and then there's complications for the lung and heart. Um, it actually people's risk for a heart attack uh, within the first hour of smoking goes up significantly. And um, just so okay, other people I know are going to talk about some of the, the pharmaceutical trends and, and talk um, about heroin, but just to, to note that we definitely, that's, that's a huge issue. That's what the kids in my, the groups that I do are talking about, uh, Percocets especially. They talk a lot about Percocets. And what they'll do is they'll either take them as is or they'll crush or and snort them. Um, they sometimes will even put them in marijuana and, and smoke it. Uh, they sometimes combine them with other drugs, whether it's illicit drugs or with alcohol. Uh, I mentioned Adderall as an item of concern. And we know that this can then lead to, to opiate uh, use. And finally, just uh, a few household items of concern, and then I'll end my presentation on just some, I want to leave you with some take-home tips. But just some items of concern. Uh, I, the student, just so you know, they, a, a great place to find a lot of this information, if you hear them talking about something, I, I go on YouTube and you can find actual people showing the kids how to use these items. So if you hear, that's, that's just a great resource for you as a parent. Um, but nutmeg has some um, stimulant and hallucinogenic properties um, if they, they uh, eat nutmeg. Um, cooking spray, any aerosol, basically inhalants are obviously uh, Something sometimes the first drug that a, somebody might use as a household item because of availability. Um, cough syrups, uh, cold medicine, anything with that uh, DXM in it um, has the, a high abuse potential. Whipped cream, we've heard of whippets. Um, you know, and, and I think even parents sometimes don't even think about that, but just you know, shooting the whipped cream in a child's mouth. You know, just sometimes you even have to think, oh, is that even a good idea to like, to, to do that because it may just start triggering something with them. Um, different kinds of glues they can put in baggies, dust off, which is a computer cleaner, and um, any kind of gasoline or butane. So, just um, I want to leave on a positive note. I know that's a lot in a short amount of time, a lot of, of really uh, kind of scary stuff that, that's out there. But you do play a huge role in prevention efforts. I think that that gets lost somewhere. Parents a lot of times think that their friends are the ones who influence all their decisions, <coughs> but you really are the number one influence in your child's life. Uh, many teens report that they want their parents to, to talk to them more, and many of the kids that are in support groups with me tell me they wish that they had, had you know, their parents had had those discussions with them. 
Um, and they, they'll say, I even hear it, that the one thing that really bothers them is disappointing their parents, that they are afraid that they might disappoint them. So what can you do? Um, educate early. I did, I, 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 people sometimes read the little picture before I even remember it's up there. Um, I, I see this on Facebook way more than I should. Um, if you can't read it, it just says, um, the caption says, my friend's daughter has a school assignment. Um, it was basically to write one sentence about a family member and then write a picture about it. And she wrote, my mom likes drinking wine. Okay, um, but then, you know, the parent posts it and thinks it's really funny. Uh, it's just, again, setting this a tone. You want to make sure that you're being the example. Uh, you want to convey your values really clearly. Let them know if, you know, it's, it's, it's a zero tolerance policy, what that means, and really talk that through with them. You can also have a trusted family member or a friend, somebody that you felt it, it has a close relationship with your child. Maybe they're somebody to broach the subject. They're someone who can have that, that dialogue. Um, I've been talking to my niece about this um, topic since she was three, but I picked something she could handle. We talked about cigarettes, because at the time, my dad smoked. He has quit. Um, but at the time, he did, so she saw it. Excuse me, she saw that. So we were able to have a little dialogue even at an early age. Um, use a lot, use fact-based information, talk about how their brains haven't fully developed, make sure you're standing firm um, and that you set consequences uh, <coughs> based on, on decisions they make. And use teachable moments. Sadly, there's been a lot um, in, in our area, uh, but even if you use the, the media as far as the Cory Monteith teeth from um, Lee, who passed away, uh, or Philip Seymour or Hoffman, you could use those stories to have a dialogue with the child. And I think this is great, emails, tweets, um, texts, um, pr you know, promoting your message because guess what? That's how they're communicating with everybody these days. So um, to end, just things you can do: stay involved, make sure that they have things to do between those hours of three to six. Um, that's really important. Those those hours are when we tend to see that they're getting involved. Um, they're the most dangerous times for teens. Uh, nurture your relationship with them. Accentuate the positive. Build a lot of structure um, within your family. And I left outside, um, I know Amy made tons of copies. There's something called the 40 developmental assets. There are 40 things that we know that uh, children need to thrive and survive and overcome adversity. So I think they might have handed them to you when you came in. They're, they're excellent tools. And those are just for 12 to 18 year olds, but they make them for younger kids as well. And if you suspect use, you need to take action. Call someone at the school, a counselor, Call your family physician um, and make sure you're having having that um, someone who supports you. So thank you. Tracy, that was very informative. Very appreciate that. Uh, you notice in some of those slides, and so many of those slides, these products are all found in our homes. That we must stop it. The other thing that occurred to me is how important our kitchen tables are. So we have that dialogue with our kids, even adult children, that have that ongoing dialogue. The average age in Massachusetts of those that have heroin overdoses is 22 years old. So my children are 32, 31, and 28. And, and parenting is never over. Those conversations have to happen all the time. Our next speaker is, um, uh, well, Jason Higgins couldn't be with us now uh, due to the uh, unfortunate and tragic death of his fellow officer. Uh, he couldn't be with us this evening. Jason uh, is a Plymouth North High School resource officer right here in this building. So I'm going to take a moment, if I may, and talk about uh, in school resource officers. Uh, it's something that's been very important to me uh, uh, for quite a long time. My son Ryan is a police officer and he was so influenced by his school resource officer that he uh, wrote him a letter when he was in eighth grade asking if he could do a ride along with him. And the officer from Kingston, Detective Wells, allowed him to do that. He rode around the cruise for a couple of nights. And when Ryan graduated from the police academy, uh, Officer Wells gave him in a, in a frame uh, the handwritten letter that Ryan wrote thanking him for that opportunity to ride, around, ride along with him. 
That's the impact that resource officer have. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's a police officer assigned right here in the schools. I don't find it a coincidence at all that as the municipalities have been strained, uh, have been constrained in their budgets and strained to make uh, the bottom line uh, balance, that one of the first things that have been cut out in many communities are the resource officers. And at, at the corresponding, uh, during that corresponding period, uh, drugs in our schools have increased. I think it's very important to understand what a resource officer does and had, had Jason been with us, he could have done so far more eloquently than I'm about to. When you've got a great resource officer in the school, he or she becomes part of the culture of that student body. That resource officer is not a hard guy or a hard woman. That resource officer is a friend and a resource. A resource for information, for protection, for guidance, for cover, a handshake, a high five. And then what happens is that child who's right on the bubble, who's being threatened or bullied or being uh, uh, tempted to do something they would not have otherwise done, it gives that child a person to go to that can provide good, good information, guidance, and a safe haven. Now, what we never talk about in front of kids, but so, so greatly important, is that resource officer is a police officer. So with that information that that resource officer gets here in the school, they're providing to the detectives on the street. And then they're able to, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, instead of the child being at the fence to pick up some Oxycontin. It's a plainclothes defect, uh, detective who's at that fence line and intercepting that bad guy and putting that bad guy in jail where that bad guy belongs. So that's the type of communication that goes on back and forth between a resource officer and the students in the school. Two years ago, a year ago, January, I filed a bill in the legislature to provide resource officers in every school in Massachusetts. This was a year. This was a year ago, January. And the funding model was that was the same as that as the Community Preservation Act, if you're familiar with that. It's where you're allowed to set money aside above the two and a half limit, and the state matches whatever funds the town puts into the uh, school police uh, school resource officer program. It's a local option. Towns can do it. Towns don't have to do it. But it would put resource officers in the schools to fight drugs, to educate kids, to be the first line of defense against intruders or bullying. I'm sad to report to you that the bill was reported on the committee and into study last Thursday, which means it's essentially dead for the season. So we've handed out copies of a text in the emails for the leaders of the State House asking you to mail to each of those leaders, starting with the government, and ask them to reconsider that bill, bring it out of bring it back out of study. And let's get it done in this session before we adjourn in June and begin to give cities and towns the resources they need to fight this fight that is in our community right now. And the example I'd like to use is water. If our water supply was contaminated with arsenic, we'd have a special town meeting and we'd spend thousands and millions of dollars to fix our water supply because it's precious to us. I'm going to choke but yet we can't get offices in the schools. So I'm going to ask each of you to please pick up this text and the way out we'll do it today. It's a paragraph where you'll write to the, the leaders of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, asking them, if not my bill, some other bill, that will bring school resource officers back into the schools so we can give our kids, our children, what they need in order to do that. And, and Dr. Masters, I commend you for having one right here on Plymouth North and the school committee for having one right here on Plymouth North. That's what we need, that's what we need to do. And I ask for your help, not only in writing to leadership, but making it viral and getting your friends and their friends to write to leadership. I wish uh, Jason had been here, but Jason is doing um, God's work tonight uh, with his fellow officers and, and, and staying with the uh, family of the fallen police officers. So Jason, we thank you for that. Our next speaker is Detective Lieutenant Tony Gomes, now caught expedition for the police department. Uh, Tony? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for the moment of silence. It's my just uh, great to be 
to uh, witness by his brothers. Uh, my name is Tony Gomes. I've been a detective lieutenant in Plymouth for five years. I've been 27 years on the job here, and for the last five years I've been the supervisor of a 10 man division. What I'd like to talk to you about a little bit is my division and what we're trying to accomplish in, this, in the uh, town and some of the obstacles that we're coming across. And I'd like to talk to you about some of the drugs you should be watching for with your children. Um, we do have a narcotic subdivision in my 10 man division. Um, one of the officers uh, is a plainclothes detective and he works with the DEA task force down in Cape. Um, he is available to help us out and uh, bring the manpower that the DEA uh, provides down in Cape. But um, I'm, we are limited to how many people that we're doing this. Um, it's a full time division, that's so all they do is, is uh, investigate drugs. Town of Plymouth has experienced the same drug issues as our neighboring communities to some degree. You're not immune to what you may consider a city crime. You run so regular. Plymouth Police Department has a full-time narcotics division whose focus is to investigate and arrest many drug dealers in the fight against these crimes. We've been successful in identifying uh, many of the subjects who are responsible for continuing this drug trade, and there are, but there are more individuals every day getting involved in it. Some of the um, issues and that we, the legislative uh, type issues that we've uh, encountered. Uh, are in 2006, uh, hypodermic needles were legalized. It, it made it um, difficult for us for um, arresting people with the needles. There are more needles out there now, more readily available, and it assists in, in uh, the kids and, and the adults with their illegal narcotics. In 2009, when I first took over the detective division, marijuana became um, decriminalized for less than an ounce. There's a lot of it out there. It became a civil infraction with a hundred dollar fine, and not much we could do about that. Um, since 2009, we've um, issued about 570 civil infractions. In the past, those would have been counted as arrests because these people have been um, brought in and uh, processed through the system. In 2012, there was a crime bill um, that the governor signed. It was um, to improve law enforcement tools. Unfortunately, some of those tools were taken away from us or reduced. Um, they, they reduced the trafficking rates. Um, before to charge somebody um, with trafficking of heroin, say, for instance, we only need 14 grams. We now need 18 grams. School zone violations were reduced. In this town, um, I'm sure you know, we have a school, a park, um, a daycare, which is about on every block, even though we have 100 square miles here. The, the, um, the zone was reduced from 1,000 feet, which is over three football fields, down to 300 feet. These two, um, these two items here triggered man minimum mandatory sentencing, and that's made it difficult for us to go after these people and, um, and get them in the system and, and get them behind bars permanently. Um, in 2013, a very good law, and I stand behind it as well, but um, anyone experiencing an active overdose, we are unable to charge them with a crime of, of uh, possession. And the bill was uh, well intended, it's to keep people from, from dying. Uh, now the addicts are uh, not afraid to call for medical assistance and it saved a lot of lives. But just, these are just a few of the things that have, have changed the way we do business. Uh, drug dealing in our town and everywhere else has become more mobile, makes it more difficult for us to investigate, to uh, surveil. Uh, we've, we've had to deal with the uh, food and drug scandal um, up at the uh, Boston lab. It's uh, overturned a lot of cases, it's released a lot of prisoners out of jail and brought some more of the, um, the dealers back. Um, this is the boring part of this, the uh, speech, but um, I just want to give you some statistics in Plymouth on what we've accomplished. In 2013, um, we, we prepared about 14 search warrants. Out of those 14 search warrants, about 35% of them were for heroin dealers, 21% for marijuana, 21% prescription pills and about 7% were cocaine. The rest, the other 16% were other drugs. Out of the 28 undercover drug purchases that we made, 
22 of those were, were for heroin. There's a lot of it out there. Um, bookings in 2013, out of, we got 45 out of 220 charges, um, heroin would be laid in Class A. Uh, 2014, we had, we have so far had three search warrants successfully. Um, and one of them is, um, two of them were for heroin, one for cocaine, but one of them was a trafficking case. We got a lot of weight off this kid, and we took a, a big deal off, off the streets. Last year, in 2013, we had um, three suspected heroin-related deaths. This year, so far, we've already experienced three in the first few months. The ages range from 21 to 37 on the victims on, on all six cases. Uh, with these problems, we start, um, we believe it's um, alcohol abuse, marijuana, experimentation, prescription medication, it, which leads to the harder drugs like heroin. Uh, we feel that this is the responsibility of the family to ensure that children don't have direct access to these drugs. <coughs> alcohol is everywhere. Prescription drugs need to be kept in the These are the most commonly abused items in the home. Alcohol has always been one of the most available and used substances and a gateway to misusing drugs. We have seen the results of teenagers under the influence of alcohol. They are susceptible to alcohol poisoning, sexual assaults, and often become involved in tumultuous and erratic behavior. Just that, um, the, I just wanted to go over at the social host law in Massachusetts so that you all know this. Um, Adults are not allowed to provide, give, or allow guests in their home under 21 years of age to use alcohol. The only exception is if it's their child or their grandchild. You should be aware of this because um, it, this also includes your child as a provider, which we would call an underage drinking party. If you go on vacation and your child is at home and provides alcohol or allows a party in your home, this is going to put you in a um, flag of this. Not only will your child get arrested, but you, you could face criminal penalties as well. If anybody got you that gets hurt in that, you're going to be sued um, civilly. Uh, we have a zero tolerance in our town uh, towards alcohol-related um, offenses. You will see kids coming in uh, 10, 12 at a time if they're at a house party and it's um, providing alcohol. We do also work with courts and um, put these kids through a diversion program rather than put them through the, um, the criminal uh, justice system. It's a, it's a way to um, wake, wake them up but not get them a permanent record. Uh, the schools also have a, um, a zero tolerance policy on drugs and alcohol. Jason is going to touch on that. Um, if he had been. Fortunately, I can't speak for him. Uh, so next time, I wanted to talk a little bit about marijuana. Although small quantities of marijuana were decriminalized in 2009, it continues to be one of the early gateway drugs um, to drug addictions. There are medicinal purposes to the drug, I agree with that, but there is no healthy child out there that needs to be using marijuana. Teen use can lead to other problems. And um, I'm not sure if you touched on these, but it, it changes their brain functions, it can increase their heart rates and appetite. It can alter their memories, um, lead to problem solving and thinking problems. And there are risks to the brain, too, as well. So it should not be um, condoned by anyone that, that marijuana is just a, uh, an easy drug or a, or a simple drug or a happy drug. We do have future challenges with marijuana coming up, um, as you've probably seen in the news. There will be some marijuana dispensaries in the state. Plymouth is going to be hosting probably one of them. We do not know what this is going to bring. Um, it's going to be a wait and see thing. But, um, our, our position is we're going to just we'll go with the flow, but we will we'll monitor this very closely. Uh, prescription medications, you touched on very uh, Briefly there, there was a wider acceptance in society towards prescription medications. They prescribe the medical personnel we trust and are out there to help their well-being. 
However, the same medications can create unwanted addictions and lead to abuse by those who do not prescribe them, mainly the kids. Um, there are many youths out there now uh, prescribed medications in the amphetamine classes to combat ADD and ADHD, that's the Adderall and Ritalin. It is being abused. Um, there are mood stabilizers like the Razapam out there, Xanax, Suboxone. There are, your, your children are very active now, so there are young adults who suffer sports injuries or, or they could be in a severe car accident and they actually have a, a severe injury. They're going to be prescribed painkillers and some of those can be pleased with addiction. Your Percocets, your oxycodones, the 800 milligram uh, Motrin uh, ibuprofen. All of these things should be locked and you should be watching what your kids are taking. And the need for these drugs has passed. We need to either block these away or even dispose of the problem. Speak with your physicians. Ask them about how addictive these drugs are so that you can monitor them with your kids. Many times they get a prescription and it's 30 doses, 30 pills in, in a bottle. Um, I've, I've had injuries before, I've had operations. You get, you get a bottle of 30 of these. You may need them, you may not need them, but you end up with them in your home. These need to be locked away or discarded. Pills on the open market are very expensive. The kids that start on these usually get them from the home or, or friends, and they don't cost them anything at first. But once they're addicted and they have to buy these on the street, it gets very expensive. One perk on the street right now could be $35 to $40. When you start seeing things disappearing from your homes, they, um, and I'm not just talking kids, uh, young adults, people in their 20s and 30s, they're stealing from the families. We see them going into pawn shops, taking the jewelry from the family, <coughs> cashing, it, cashing it in for, um, for, for money, and going out and buying, supporting the habit. Under the um, prescription meds, just so you know, uh, Plymouth, as a uh, safe destruction method. Uh, last year, Plymouth County DA sponsored a program within the, uh, the county, and we have a, what is called a med box at the police station. It's in the, in the front lobby. It's uh, so you can walk in at any time of the day or night, because you know, the police station is open 24 7. Uh, you can dispense your old medications in a locked container there and just walk away. You don't have to check in with the um, station officer. You just walk in, drop your stuff in there. The only thing that's not allowed <clears throat> are liquids and needles. Because I, I, I appreciate that because I don't want to get stuck when I open it up. Um, just, just know that that's the, uh, it's improper to dispose of these things down the toilet or in the trash. They work their way into the water systems. They leach down and they poison the water system. So um, what we do with these prescription meds every so often, we bring them up to the CMS and they're um, incinerated. Um, heroin, big, the big topic of the day. Heroin is a synthetically altered form of morphine. When injected into the body, it becomes morphine. It slows your heartbeat, it creates a feeling of euphoria. It's highly potent and only takes one dose to create an addiction. If you had to equate it with alcoholism, you could uh, times it by 10. That's how addictive this is. It's cheap to purchase on the street. It's cheaper than pills. And as these kids get um, addicted to the pills, and it's too expensive, they turn to the um, heroin. It can be snorted, injected, and smoked in many forms. What does it look like? What you're looking for at home? If you if you suspect this, it can be in two forms. It can be a white powdery substance. It looks like powdered sugar. The way it's sold is usually in the little corner of a, a baggie. It's snipped. It's put in that baggie and tied in the knot. That's what you're looking for. It can also be uh, brown in color, almost looking like cinnamon. Um, the, the uncommon form of it is black tar, which we haven't seen around here in Plymouth. But that would, that would be a black tarry substance. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is um, drug dealers in, in um, general. 
in my day, <coughs> and I'm dating myself now, in the 70s and 80s, you used to think of the drug dealer as the big guy that came down from the city and would sell all the kids and, and drive away. Today, drug dealers are mostly drug users supporting the habit. Obesity and Plymouth are individuals selling to support their own habit by purchasing a, a supply of heroin, cutting the product down to a street level dose, and using their profit to fund their own addictions. I'd have to say about 90 to 95 percent of our arrests are users, and the same percentage in our buyers too, 90 to 95 percent. Although they're users, they have taken a stand now as a dealer and we go after these people, the ones we know are sick. The court system, and I think the judge will explain that better, about um, the drug court, what their purpose is to help these kids that, that are hooked on this stuff and get them, get them help. But once they turn into a dealer, and we see them all dealing with a lot of product, those are the ones we're going after and those are the ones we're trying to get hard. They will take the stuff and they will cut it down. Um, they will use cutting agents. I don't have all the, the different names of the cutting agents but they'll, to make to make that product more um, more profitable. They'll cut they'll cut it down and, and uh, split it down with the agents. They get more product out of it, more profit, more money. We have a second type of dealer that we see a lot, and they are former users and addicts. They're the worst type to us. They, they're recovering. They know what this drug does. They know that it's very easy to, to uh, keep the addiction going. And they're doing it strictly for profit. They account for a good 5 to 10% of the deals that we, we find. That we do. Now, why are these people dying so much? In 2013, Plymouth has, has experienced about three um, heroin related deaths. This year alone, we've had three in the first three months. I believe that um, some of the reasons that they're dying is um, you've seen some reports of the product being laced with um, other, other items like fentanyl. It's probably a small uh, version of that. Most of, a lot of the addicts die because they are in recovery, they come back, they have a slip, and instead of starting off small, their uh, bodies are people used to a certain tolerance. They come back, they start off right where they left off, and then they have an instant overdose, and it could lead to death because the body hasn't created that tolerance again, that level. Um, also, the, um, there's a difference in purity and strength on the street, depending on which dealer you go to, and um, you know, they're, not, they're not very particular about staying with the same deal or some uh, selling something that's a lower strength than the others. Um, uh, in the past, it was like 20 to 30 percent purity, and now it's up to 80 and 90 percent. So, I, in closing, I just want to tell you uh, what does a heroin addict look like? It looks like anybody in this building right now. Um, watch your children. If they start experiencing loss of appetite and weight, it's a, it's a warning sign. Um, unlike, 20, unlike cocaine and marijuana, this is a 24-hour addiction, and it will continue. So talk to your children, keep an open communication, uh, discuss the dangers of these drugs with them, and know where your children are, who they're with, and don't assume other parents have the same rules that you, that, that you have. Thank you. I want to go back to marijuana just for a minute uh, because I think as the epidemic gets, gets larger and gets more serious, we have a tendency to talk about spice, we have a tendency to talk about cocaine, we have a tendency to talk about Percocet and Oxycontin and, of course, the beast of them all, heroin. And you'll hear kids say that marijuana is now decriminalized. No problem. You'll hear parents say that at least they're not doing cocaine or Percocet or Oxycontin or worse. I want to say this to you. One of the joys, perhaps the only joy, of getting older is you get to learn from your own children. My youngest son, who's the medic in Boston, 
I asked him at dinner a couple of weeks ago at Child Voice, there's a plug for mine. Uh, I said, is marijuana a real problem, Pat? And you know what he said to me? He says, Dad, think of it in terms of a forest fire. It starts as a cigarette in the forest. You don't hear anything about it for days. It doesn't make a sound. You don't hear about it. You can walk right by it. It can be smoldering under the brush and you don't know it. And you don't pay attention to it. And then all of a sudden it begins to create a little bit of a brush fire. But you're not close to it. So you can't put it out immediately. And then a little bit of time goes on, it spreads, and now it's covering a couple of acres. And from the, your front porch, you can see the smoke in the distance. So you know something's wrong out there, but it's not the yard door stuff, so you're not worried about it. It's not all that bad. All of a sudden, it spreads. And they call for the apparatus and for the support from far and wide. But it takes a while for them to get there, and you can't put the forest fire out. Now it's at your doorstep. Now it's right at your porch. And now you get your hose up, your garden hose up, you're trying to knock it down, but it's just not enough. Then your house burns down. And the next day, you're looking at your rubble, your smoldering rubble. And you say, boy, I wish I paid attention to that little tiny cigarette on the ground. Marijuana is a pathway to all types of drugs. So if you've got teens that think it's OK, be a parent, tell them it's not OK. And, and deal with it right there and right then, like it's a raging forest fire. It deserves that level of attention. Our next speaker is my friend Tom Audette. Tom is the gentleman I spoke to about in my introduction, the gentleman I met at uh, that beautiful night, that fall night, uh, spring night at Cookout. Uh, Tom lost his, his, his beautiful daughter, Joey, to heroin. And, and speaking of heroes, uh, Tom was shared his story with us before, and he's offered to do it again this evening, particularly focusing on the signals, because that's why we're here tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, again, my name is Tom Odette. I'm the parent one of you want to be. Uh, my wife, Michelle, is usually with me. Uh, she's a police officer. Plymouth, and unfortunately, she was up in Boston today with uh, an officer who was a good friend of us, uh, so only she's here. Um, as I start to tell you the story of Jillian, I want you to try and think of a child in your life that uh, might be one of your own kids, might be a friend of theirs, uh, a lot of fun, always laughing, smiling, the kind of kid that makes you laugh, uh, have that infectious laugh all the time, good nature, just, just good to be around. Um, that, was, that was my daughter, Jillian. Uh, as a young child, a typical child, playing with her cat, playing with her dolls, as she got a little older into sports, played softball, um, and um, you know, normal things that she did with her friends. Uh, through her teenage years, uh, Jillian gave us almost no trouble whatsoever. I can count the number of times on one hand that we had incidents with Jillian. Uh, when she was about 17, she wanted to go away to New Hampshire with some friends for the weekend. But that was a big no-no. We were the worst parents in the world for saying no. Um, and again, through those teenage years, as, as we talked about looking out for our kids, we were the parents that would actually call when she said she was staying over somebody's house. Uh, as she got a little older, we would drive by and make sure her car was there, that kind of thing. Not that we didn't trust her, but we just wanted to keep her honest to make sure that um, she was doing the right thing. Um, again, we didn't have those uh, troubles with her. Uh, she graduated from Plymouth South, uh, was into cosmetology. These are some of the courses that she took. She dreamed of owning her own hair salon someday. Um, as a teenager, she was very good with money. Uh, from the first time she had her, a job, uh, from the time you know, she was into her 20s, never asked us for money. Uh, imagine that, a teenager not borrowing money. Uh, she was self-sufficient. Uh, when she got her first car, I told her I would match whatever she saved and put it down towards the car. Uh, big mistake. I was very surprised how much money she put together. They <laughs> <laughs> come up with the balance. Um, now, when Jillian turned 21, um, changed a bit. Uh, she definitely liked the nightlife. She liked that independence, that freedom, as so many of us do. I remember turning 21, heading up into Boston, all the different nightclubs, and it, it was fun to be out. Uh, but my daughter liked that, uh, liked to be out with her friends. But even then, she was responsible, uh, would call home, tell us where she was going to be, uh, the whole little drink and drive. And she, if she was going to stay somewhere, she would get that phone call. If we needed her home, she would be home. She was a great big sister to her little brother, Matthew. Uh, real, a really, really good kid. Um, when she was 22, uh, she, she met a boyfriend. She's had several boyfriends, of course, but uh, she, she met a boyfriend uh, 
uh, older than her, seven or eight years her, her elder. Uh, nice enough guy. Um, my wife and I feel we were a pretty good judge of character. In, in this case, we were mistaken. Uh, as it turned out, her boyfriend was, uh, was a long-time heroin addict. And I had always thought, um, just the way we're conditioned to think what a heroin addict is supposed to look like. Uh, and we have that withdrawn um, look that we think that that's what they're, uh, they're pale, they're thin, they're sickly looking. It wasn't the case at all. You'd be over the house in the backyard by the pool in shorts, no shirt on, tanned, muscular, good looking guy. No issues whatsoever um, that would give me the red flag that this was something that was a heroin uh, I learned a lot about that because, again, it can, as was just mentioned, it can be anybody. Uh, so after about a year of that relationship, uh, Julie wanted to move in with him. Uh, the really, relationship was getting better. She, you know, she really cared for him. Um, so we, I was a little hesitant because he was older. I had a talk with him about uh, Julie. And although she was older, uh, I felt she was still a little bit naive in this area, and I wanted to make sure she was being taken care of. And, uh, I let her go, and, and I, I thought that was uh, a good thing. She's at an age now where, where she's going to uh, find life and you know, have those experiences. Um, it was um, a couple months later than that, uh, after that, my wife and I were, were uh, making plans to go to a um, recent uh, fire hockey game over in uh, Kingston, a charity fundraiser. And my daughter had come by that day, it was dropped off to do some laundry. My wife had been, she was unhappy, she was sad, somber, complaining about her boyfriend, um, asking me why I was such jerks and so forth, and you know, trying to answer that question, and I don't know, we just thought. <laughs> so, um, but, but again, we, we had good dialogue, her and I, and we could talk and share those stories on her. So, she, in hindsight, she was reaching out that night, and I, I wish she reached out just a little bit more. Um, I didn't see the signs that, that, that this was something uh, to look for. And again, we get her through those uh, teenage years and we, we thought our, our battle was over. Uh, we didn't realize it needed to continue. Um, so that, that night, I had dropped my daughter off at her apartment, went to the uh, fundraiser, and back that night, later on, my wife and I went to bed. A little after 3 o'clock in the morning, my wife woke me up. You know, she's looking out the window and says, there's some cruises out front. Something's wrong. So not a, not a pleasant feeling at all that time of the night. My son Matthew uh, was younger, and because we were out that night, he was staying at a friend's house for the night, so he wasn't home either. So something had gone wrong, we didn't know what it was. Um, so we come down the stairs, my wife and I, we open the door, uh, there's the chief, the captain, and a couple of plain clothes officers, all friends of ours, all people we know. Uh, he looked at my wife and he, and he just said two words. He said, it's, it's Jillian. And that was it. Um, I can't, I can't explain what that feeling was like to experience that. And I, I hope to God none of you ever have that situation happen. Um, it devastated my family instantly. Uh, we still had to tell my son who was who was staying at a friend's house, and when I picked him up and brought him home, it was it was even harder. I wish we could have just kept it ourselves and, and not had to share that grief with anybody else. Um, so we struggled for a while, wondering. You know, what happened? Uh, we felt that foundation that we had built uh, was strong enough to get her through anything. Uh, she had so shown signs to us of knowing when to get away from any trouble, and it, it seemed like she was going to be okay. So we struggled with that, that, that voice, that influence that all our kids go through, uh, that, that can pull them away from knowing right from wrong, and yet they still, they're still tempted. We're all tempted as adults. I mean, we've all done things that we know we probably shouldn't have done when we were teenagers and younger kids. We get talked into have one more shot or try this or try that, and we do it, don't we? No, we most of us have. Uh, we don't. We don't realize at the time that that's something bad, and these kids today don't realize what's going to happen either. Um, they're tempted very easy, and they're tempted most likely by somebody they trust. You know, our kids don't ever meet that scary drug dealer that's been mentioned. They they, they meet that local drug deal of a friend, and the friend is not trying to cause the problems. It, it's not intentional, but it happens. Just like the, the drunk driver that takes his friends home and gets in an accident. He doesn't mean to, it's not intentional, but there still needs to be accountability there. So we, we, we struggled with that, and at the same time, uh, Sean Kelly from Channel 5 was doing a report on um, the low-level drug offenders, and, and, and this drug offender that had missed Christmas, this drug dealer, and the sympathy shown for this um, drug dealer, that, again, that wanted to be out of jail and back home with their family. 
Uh, my wife had uh, wrote a very uh, pleasant letter offering the flip side of that story. We would love to have had them sit with us so we could tell the other side of that low-level drug dealer and the impact it had on our family. Uh, unfortunately, um, we, we never got a response. And since that time, I actually made it a crusade to try and reach out to the media and, and get their attention about what was happening with, with the drug problem. I always felt that once it got on the real news, and what I mean by the real news, the major networks, Channel 4, 5, 7, Fox, once we saw it on TV and we saw the numbers, something would be done about it. And just recently we saw that happen. It leads lead us to believe that there's a major drug surge going on right now, but the truth is it's been going on for years. The media attention is the only surge that's happening right now. And, and it, again, it's been happening for a while. So the and again, as we struggle and try and figure out what happened and try and move forward and, and find out what we can do about this and help, um, we, I, I keep coming back to the uh, war on drugs and, and the way it was fought. And in, in my opinion, one man's opinion, it was always fought the wrong way. It was a war going after kings when it was actually a game of pawns. They should have gone after the, the low-level drug dealers. Those are the only ones that our kids will ever meet. You know, those are the ones that are, they, there needs to be accountability there. I know they're not intending to do it. Some of these kids are in trouble themselves, but we need to hold them accountable when these kinds of things happen. When these happen, these low-level drug dealers are the serial killers in our community. You know, in the statistics, statistics you'll hear, you'll hear different numbers from from town to town, and the numbers are so different depending on what you look up. Uh, but when the numbers are that big and they're that different, it usually indicates they're moving so fast that they're hard to track. Uh, and another issue that I, I've struggled with as I've gotten more involved is the stigma tied to the drugs. The way these kids are villainized uh, for, for being a drug user. Uh, and, and that's tough to take. Uh, I was recently uh, with some friends, and, and they're good friends of mine, and they still are, and the subject of Narcan came up. And you, you've heard that mentioned before, and, and real quick, what Narcan is. Our Narcan is um, a cure that, it's a nasal spray. It's about the size of a nothing pad, a little smaller. Um, and what it does is it scrapes up the nostrils of, of the kid that's having an overdose. When a kid is having a heroin overdose, uh, the receptors in the brain are blocked by the opiates from the heroin. And it slows down the breathing and eventually stops the breathing. What the Narcan does is it releases those um, receptor blockers that the opiates have, knocks the opiates out of the way, and, and literally revives the kid. Uh, quickly, but however, he still needs medical attention because he can fall back in and overdose again. Uh, it's, I, I've seen the training with this. It's very easy to use. Um, I'm going to say that a first grader could do it uh, once they learn how to use it. And unfortunately, we'll probably... Um, they forgot I was standing there and I lost my daughter even though they knew her. Um, I didn't forget. Um, I didn't get mad at that. I took it as an opportunity to talk and try and create a little bit of understanding that these kids are valuable lives that, that are being really, really lost. These kids were born into this world they were given that special name that we all think is so important when we name our kids in hopes that they have a healthy and happy life. We're not, we're not wishing them to be rich and wealthy. What we really want as parents is that our kids are happy and healthy. And I was trying to explain to, to these friends of mine, you know, how important that, that is that they, they think this way. You know, that could be somebody else's Jillian. That's somebody else's special kid. And it breaks my heart to think that, that people actually think that way. I'm not mad about it. But this is the problem in, in society, in this culture, that we have to change. You know, we, we have to convince people that these lives are worth saving. I, I found this poem on a uh, website recently, and it was written, I believe, by a girl that had recovered um, in a treatment center. And it's, it's really powerful. I, I'd like to get this out to the kids, but I want to read this uh, real quick. My name is Harold. I destroy homes and tear families apart. I take your children and that's just the start. I'm more costly than diamonds, more costly than gold. The sorrow I bring is a sight to behold. If you need me, I'm easily found. I live all around you, in schools and in town. I live with the rich and I live with the poor. I live down the street and maybe next door. My power is awesome, try me, you'll see. But if you do, you may never break free. Try me once, I might let you go. Try me again, I will own your soul. When I possess you, you'll steal and you'll lie. You'll do what you have to just to get high. 
You lie to your mother, you'll steal from your dad. When you see their tears, you should feel sad. But you'll forget your morals and how you were raised. I'll be your conscience, I'll teach you my ways. I take kids from parents and parents from kids. I turn people from God and separate friends. I'll take everything from you, your looks and your cry. I'll be with you always, right by your side. You'll give up everything, your family, your home, your friends and your money, then you'll be alone. I'll take and I'll take till you have nothing to give. When I'm finished with you, you'll be lucky to live. If you try me, be warned, this is no game. If given the chance, I will drive you insane. I'll ravish your body, I'll control your mind. I'll own you completely, your soul will be mine. The nightmares I'll give you while lying in bed, the voices you'll hear from inside your head, the sweats and the shakes, the visions you'll see, I want you to know these are all gifts from me. By then it's too late, and you'll know in your heart that you are mine and we shall not part. You'll regret that you tried me, you always do, but you came to me, not I to you. You knew this would happen many times you were told, but you challenged my power and chose to be bold. You should have said no and just walked away. If you could live that day over, now what would you say? I'll be your master and you'll be my slave. I'll even go with you when you go to your grave. Now that you've met me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can bring you more misery than words can tell. Come take my hand and I'll take you to hell. I would love to get that out to as many kids as possible. Uh, I think it's a very powerful uh, poem. And again, author of no I don't know who wrote that, but uh, I, I wanted to share that. Um, in, in closing, again, these kids that we're trying to save, these families that are struggling, and I've heard so many unbelievably horrible stories. A mother just recently told me she was begging for the courts to put her kid in jail in hopes that he, may, he might live and have a chance to get him into a treatment center later. These are true stories that are happening. These kids that we're trying to save, they deserve to grow old. They deserve to be sitting in a rocking chair someday, surrounded by family, their kids and generations of kids. And when one of their grandkids says, Nana, my papa, tell me about your life, these kids deserve to be able to tell that story. Thank you. I want to talk about the word stigma, just very, very quickly. If any one of our children had leukemia, you'd shut out from the window. My daughter's got leukemia, and I'll do anything in my power to find a cure. But when it comes to drugs, there's a stigma attached to it. And people are reluctant to scream from a rooftop when a child is sick and needs help. Let's all agree tonight that the stigma is not important. The impact it may have on our family reputations or from our friends or our family or our mothers or our fathers is not important. You've got some, experts, some real experts up here that offer extraordinary help. There are resources out there. The hell with the stigma. Focus on your child's well-being as if your child was stricken with an acceptable, uh, non-stigmatized disease. That's something I'd like to all think about. The next panelist, uh, I'm so honored to have Rosemary Linehan. Judge Linehan is the presiding judge at Plymouth District Court, and uh, she's a modest lady, so she hates me to say she's the founder of, but I believe she is, the specialty drug court in Plymouth. And Rosemary will give the statistics, but the specialty drug court is a different approach for dealing with sick people. And the recidivism rate, if I have this right, uh, Rosemary, meaning they go back, is about 6% compared to those areas where there is no specialty drug court. We just deal with illness as, as crimes and as cri people, as criminals. The recidivism rate is over 60%. Uh, people are talking far and wide throughout the country, all throughout the country about the work Rosemary is doing. And I'm honored, honored here to have Rosemary to have you with us here tonight to talk about it. Thank you.
can, can you hear me? <laughs> so so uh, the world has changed, and it's changed in so many ways. I've been a judge for 20 years, and I never thought when I went on the bench after 15 years of practice and going to law school as a DA and a male practice in Plymouth, raised my kids in this jurisdiction. I have two kids, they're in their late 20s, early, well, late 20s. Um, that instead of saying allowed, denied, overruled, and sustained, that I would say, Officer Bledsoe, that's a benzodiazepine withdrawal. Could you let the sheriff know that so that this guy doesn't go cold turkey? That's what I say in the courtroom. That's different than what I thought I'd be saying as a judge. So the world has changed, and it's changed rapidly. I think I have about 12 minutes, so I, I, I want somebody to give me the hook. This is a lot of information, and the hardest part for me is to pare it down. The first thing I want to tell everybody in this room, and I think all of you come from the Plymouth area, is you couldn't have better champions than you have in your legis legislative delegation for this issue. Vinny DiMacito, Tom Coulter, Senate President Murray, uh, has, have been front and center on this stuff from day one when nobody was talking about it. Um, Vinny and I were sharing cell phone numbers a long time ago. Um, coming to the courthouse, how do we fix this? Tom Coulter, uh, running things like this. Senate President Murray, putting money, along with these other legislators and the whole legislature, really getting behind it, putting money into treatment. Because we couldn't do our jobs if we didn't have the treatment. But again, I'm gonna tell you, you couldn't have more champions in the legislative, in the, in the state house than you've got from the Plymouth area. So you need to remember that uh, those folks do a fabulous job and I'm proud to be in at least a co-branch of government and work with them. I also want to mention, you also have some great folks in the town of Plymouth. Your fire chief, um, Ed Bradley, your police chief, Mike Bateri, um, you know, the, the school here, um, you know, Gary's been unbelievable in getting, we, we work as partners. There are no longer silos in the field. We don't talk to each other. All of us talk to each other. Um, so uh, we're always communicating and trying to find better ways to do things. Um, and I also want to mention Sheriff McDonald and the district attorney. Uh, you know, Tim Cruz put together that uh, diversion program, and it wasn't a popular thing to do. You don't hear too many DAs saying, I'm going to try to divert people out of the criminal justice system. He did that. And he did it because he doesn't want to put a stigma on kids that are all drinking at a party. Um, and so the way he did it was he put together this diversion program. He started it in, in Hingham, and then it went to Wareham and Brockton and Plymouth. And what it does is that when kids are drinking at a party or they're drinking on the beach and they're using marijuana or whatever they're doing, they go into this diversion program and they don't end up with a criminal record. They have to go to classes to learn about the science of addiction and they have to do some community service. And it works. It works well. A lot of those low-level offenders we find don't come back. So our evidence-based practice tells us that you know, sometimes, I mean, everybody, every one of us has been a teenager, you know, did you drink when you were a teenager? We did. The problem with it now is that it is being coupled with a lot of other more lethal drugs, and, and we're going to talk about those tonight. I want to say this to the parents in this room, and I'm a parent myself. Your kids are sponges. You know that. So if you drink, they're going to drink. They're going to think it's okay to drink. If you smoke dope, they're going to think it's okay to smoke dope. If you have Percocets, in that closet, in that cabinet, in the bathroom, then they're going to use them and they're going to try them. There's a good chance of it. You're increasing the risk by having those. I had a family member recently, um, well, in the last few years, die of cancer. In the closet was a bottle of oxycodone. Uh, by the way, the manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, has now corrected the formula for that drug, so OxyContin, so they can't tamper with, they, they, they can't, it, it was time, it, 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 the time release part of that drug can't be tampered with, so they can't get the whole burst in one pill. So what do they do? They just go to Perk 30s and Perk 15s, which are, the, which, which are called um, oxycodone. And you get them if you have your wisdom teeth out, and you get them if you go to the emergency room and you have a sprained neck, they'll hand you, a, your kids walking out of that dentist office will get a script for oxycodone with a root canal, a wisdom tooth, and watch the things that people, legitimate people, are putting in their hands, as well as people that are not doing it for legitimate purposes. Watch that. Because if you take a Perk 30 or a Perk 15, by the way, all the kids we're seeing coming into the courthouse, they're using Perk 30s and Perk 15s. 
So, you know, that. But I would just say that if you have, we, we, they were in the, the medicine cabinet, and um, I was assisting following out the medicines when this person died. Guess what? The, uh, the oxy, the perks were gone. I opened it and went to throw it in the kitty litter, which is what the cranberry hospice told me to do, which is the order of the organization, and it was gone. Now, I know this stuff, and it was gone. So if you don't think that they're not looking in your cabinets, they are looking in your cabinets. You as a parent have to be a hawk. You have to watch them and make sure you know what they're doing. And if you notice your stuff's being stolen, I'm going to tell you to call the police. Because the faster you get them into treatment, and in this court, this court over here is a treatment provider. We're going, to, we're going to plug these kids into treatment. That's what we try to do. And we do utilize the jails. I want to say that Joe McDonald does a great job over there detoxing very complicated uh, poly substance abusers. I send them all the time. And I wonder if they're going to you know, be OK. And as long as we tell them what they're coming in with and we get a good idea of it, um, then he does a great job with that. I also want to mention that we started to call the fire department all the time because we're having these overdoses and having people sick in the courtroom, uh, so much so that we're trying to figure out a protocol as to how to deal with people in, in the courthouse. Um, because, because there's so much treatment going on in there, I think we're, a lot of people are coming in to get access to beds, and I think we know that. So just remember, your kids are watching everything you do. Everything you do. So what are we seeing in the courthouse? What am I seeing in the locker? I am seeing heroin, lots of heroin. Um, kids, uh, track marks on their arms. Somebody opening the door to their daughter's car and they find 42 needles in the car. But think about this as a parent. You go through all the trouble when they're little, you put the things in the plug so they won't shock themselves, you know that? You know, you worry about their teeth being straight, their teeth being white. You know, what kind of prom dress she's going to wear. All the stuff that Tom talked about. We all love our kids. And think about this. This happened. I'm telling you the story that happened. Mom comes, I get these section 35s, and we we'll talk about in a minute, coming to the courthouse all the time. And mom says, I was, we just finished, she got accepted to X College, a wonderful school any one of us would have been proud to attend. And she's mopping under the bed. And she's getting ready to pack her daughter up to go to college. And what comes out from under the bed? Three syringes. I got news for mom and dad, that's about the worst thing <coughs> you can think of. You're worrying about whether she's got those long sheets for those college dorm rooms that they have in it get the long sheets, whether you're going to buy the food card for her when she's over at you know, Boston College, or whether she's at Suffolk, or whether she's at you know, Bentley or at the University of Vermont, or Haiti. Hey. And all of a sudden, you get three syringes at your feet. And you have an epiphany that your world has changed, that there's an, that there's an explosion going on right in your world. Trust me, that's how important it is for you to know what your kids are doing. So how do you know what your kids are doing? Well, you have to watch the, 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 the subtle things that you see. If you see personality changes, you see things going on. I mean, it's, it's hard for you, all of us, it's hard for us to keep up with the internet and the way the kids know it much better than I think people that are beyond that generation know it. But I will tell you, you can't be tough enough on that stuff. And as Carol Burnett said, I think um, one of my court officers shared this with me, whose daughter was uh, addicted. Um, she talked about the treatment she put her daughter through. Her daughter actually survived the addiction, got through the other side, and died of cancer. But she said, you have to love your kids enough to make them hate you. So if, you're, if your kids are stealing their credit cards, or they're taking your gold jewelry, and they're selling that, I think that, you know, the parents think, oh, I can't go to the courthouse. I don't want to go to the courthouse. I would say to you, if they come to the courthouse, and we see behavior that has not necessarily got a drug in it, but the behavior is definitely drug-related. Shoplifting, breaking and entering, uttering checks, writing someone, getting into the dad's checkbook and writing a check and signing his name. Those are behaviors that are associated with drugs. And if you see that behavior, I would say it's not a bad idea to call the police. Because here's the deal. We have two things we can do down there that I would say are within two giant camps. There's a civil, which is called a Section 35. What's a Section 35? A Section 35 is a civil remedy that you can come to the courthouse and say, um, I'm requesting a warrant of apprehension, which is a warrant that goes out uh, for my spouse, daughter, mother, kids. I mean, we have kids coming in and getting on their parents, too. Um, alcohol or substance. And the court can hear testimony, bring the person in, 
appoint the person an attorney and see if they have lost their ability to maintain self-control as a result of this substance. If the judge makes that determination, they will go to one of four places. And this is hard because it depends on what beds are available. They have two great places, by the way, again, funded by the legislature. This delegation, the folks I mentioned, were all part of the sea change that got us beds. And those beds came in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2008, and they've been refunded and refunded. There was a major extra funding that went in in 2012. If we have treatment beds, we can provide treatment. So two places that the Department of Public Health has beds, one is at Meadowbrook Road in Brockton for the men. It's called MATSI, Men's Addiction and Treatment Center, and one in New Bedford, Women's Addiction and Treatment Center. Those are run by the Department of Public Health. Good DPH, what I call public health beds. Then there are two other places if those beds and those beds run out. They run out all the time. Then we have to utilize the Department of Correction beds. For men, we have a place um, that um, is is called the Matsey, is the it's the Matsey, I'm, I'm sorry, the MASAC unit in Bridgewater. It's not Bridgewater State Hospital, it's on the campus, it's run by the Department of Correction. We send a lot of straight civils there if we don't have any beds and they need it. I mean, if they're gonna die, they're gonna have to think about putting them in a safe place tonight. So they end up over there, been there, I tour it, um, and I, I go to Bridgewater State Hospital all the time, I often visit Nazi. Um, I'm sorry, Mesa. And it, it's basically, it's a good program for them. It, it works. Um, it's not the best, but it does its job. And then unfortunately for women, they go to MCI Framingham, um, and they get placed in a, um, a waiting trial unit, and they don't get, they get detoxed, but they don't get any treatment. So the women don't get the treatment on the Section 35 side that the men do. But a straight civil, there's not much I can do. Once they leave the courtroom, the exit door belongs to the executive branch. So that means I don't have any control over when they leave. And they usually stay for about 16 to 22 days, and then they're released. Now, it was mentioned here tonight, and it's, a, it's very important to know, that they can't use on the way out what they use on the way in. So we see a lot of these fatalities with people, kids, people are getting out. I think they can use the same amount of heroin they did when they went in 21 days ago, but they're detox and their bodies can't handle it and they overdose. That happened um, in my family to a relative's an in-law. But it happened, I saw it happen. Um, he was a law student and he went in, he it, went in, um, came out and was dead within 24 hours. Um, so it does happen and it's, it's very scary. Um, so that's the Section 35 process. It is a way to get a bed, uh, a detox bed, and, and, and it sometimes works. Um, but, but it's 21 days or 20 days, 21 days, and that sometimes isn't enough, particularly for the opiate um, addiction. And so uh, the other thing we do is deal with drug court, and I'm going to tell you about drug court. Um, before I tell you about drug court, I want to tell you about some of the substances we see in drug court and in the courthouse. I talked about um, heroin and Percocets, um, because they get the perks and then they can't afford them or they can't get them, so they get the heroin, which is really cheap. Anywhere from three to nine bucks, that's it. That's how cheap it is. Um, they stick the needles in their arm. Everyone in our drug court recently, we had some juveniles come in and watch, and I asked everyone in our drug court, tell the juveniles when you started, how you started. Virtually everyone said, I started on a pill at a party, or I got a pill for a sports injury, and then within two years, 18 months, six months, I was sticking the needle in my arm. So it goes from zero to six to quick. Um, we see K2 spice, and some of you, if I say this to a 40-year-old or a 50-year-old in the courtroom, you can't use spice, they think I'm talking about cinnamon. They do. I would say to you, anybody in this room, you got a second grader, you got a fourth grader, ask them what spice is. They'll tell you what spice is. They know what spice is. And spice could kill them. So it's a very potent form of, it's called sometimes marijuana, it's not marijuana, Google K2 Spice and watch what comes up. It's powerful stuff. Mind altering, very dangerous, all over the place. You can get it legally in convenience stores. So they also call it bath salts. Um, we see Suboxone. That is what these replacement drugs in the community that I understand have a function, methadone and Suboxone, 
When Suboxone came, we used to have been on it for years, and then Suboxone came out with, oh, this is going to be great. We have this thing, we have to have a federal license to distribute it. You know what we're seeing now? And every police officer and knows full well, we see Suboxone all over the place. We see it, we see it in the community, we see it being sold on the black market, we see kids using it, it comes in strips. It comes in clear strips. And, and people are getting their prescriptions and they're selling it because it gives people a high. So uh, it's, um, it's, it's an it's a addictive drug. It's used to replace heroin. I understand that many mental health professionals and medical professionals think it's good. I get that. Um, I, I will just mention that in our OxyContin condition, we went around the state in uh, 2008, 2009, um, and I was on a commission and we learned that many in the Mass Medical Society are addicted to opiates too, probably 10% or something, we saw something like that. Um, they go on Vivitrol, which is a blocker, and it's uh, about $800 a month, I think. Yeah, it's too cheaper than it used to be, and then it doesn't provide any highs, so it, that keeps people off the drug. So I, I think that's uh, something we might see more of in the future. We also see benzodiazepines, um, Ativan, Clonopin, any of those anti-anxiety drugs, very addictive, lights up the same part of the brain as alcohol, so they have a <coughs> valium because they're worried about a test and then they start thinking about drinking. Um, marijuana, say about marijuana. I know everybody thinks it's just a harmless thing. Have you heard everybody here tonight say that it isn't? And I will tell you this, your kid's IQ will drop two standard deviations <coughs> using marijuana. That's the difference between a nice suit and an orange jumpsuit at the House of Correction. Two standard deviations, marijuana. It isn't a harmless drug. It isn't okay. And so I don't know where it's all going, but I will tell you, it isn't okay. And we're seeing those scripts come up in the drive. I have a script. I have a script. Uh, they're telling me that all day long. I say, not here. Uh, we don't tolerate it, and we also don't let them use spice. So um, huffing, you heard about that tonight. We've had many of those. Whipped cream, well, I mean, 200 cans of whipped cream lying around the cemetery recently. Somebody huffing. Um, it isn't high. Um, so the Vivitrol and naltrexone are blockers, those we hope we'll see more of as we proceed forward. So let me tell you about drug court. What is drug court? Drug court is um, a specialty court, a trial court's coming up with many of these. We also have a mental health court in Plymouth, um, and uh, they're, different, they're different sessions. But drug court will identify individuals who are high risk uh, um, and, um, and require uh, quite a bit of supervision, so high risk individuals in the community. Um, the, in the past, they went to jail. Um, we have found that you take a 21 year old and you put them in jail for anywhere like in two, three, four months, five months, six months, you're gonna take an addict and you might turn them into a criminal. So we don't really wanna do that because we've found that our evidence-based practice tells us that's not a good way to handle the kid that's an addict. So what the specialty court does is use a different model, which is they go, first of all, they get arraigned in the court for possession of heroin or if it's, if it's shoplifting or it's uttering or it's beanie, or any of those, I'm gonna put them on drug and alcohol free screens. That's the first thing I'm gonna do. Um, and, then, and so I don't want them substituting alcohol for drugs, so I put them on both. Um, and then what happens is they go out in the community. If they are truly addicted, they, we will likely find out because we have urine screens that we do. So we'll, cut, we'll, we'll get that. We, we'll, we, I have so many on urine screens now that we don't test them uh, quite as often as I would like, pretrial defendants, but we do test them. And if they come into the courtroom and um, we're having these multiple conversations with emergency providers, you see them you know, dozing off in the courtroom. If they're on pretrial screens, all your probationers off the floor and we test them. And if they come up positive, then there's a response by the court. The court's response needs to be quick, close in time to the infraction, and meaningful, which usually means a lockup. Um, parents are horrified to see their kids go inside. I tell you, it does work. And we've had good success with it. So our first goal is to take them away from the drug. Um, when I move them back into the community, I'm putting a bracelet on them, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've said in that courtroom to the 19-year-old, and you're going to be in the house every night by 7 p.m., and you're not leaving until 7 a.m. when you go to work, and you're locked down on the weekend, so no more fighting with your parents about going out at 11 o'clock at night. And parents in the back row are going, <laughs> you know, you just don't have to argue anymore. You just say, look at me. It's me. It's no longer your parents anymore. Um, because as, as I say to the kids in Brooklyn, there's nothing good going on between 12, p 12 a.m. and 
5 a.m. Is there anything good going on out there? Right? Okay. So we all know that. So uh, one of the things we do is we put them on bracelets. So they go, if they go into drug court, and sometimes they go into drug court because if they're using in the community as a pretrial defendant, I revoke their bail and they go to jail. And then they often will want to resolve their case. Um, one of the things we do is we try to avoid a conviction for a felony. Because what does that mean? If they get convicted for a breaking and entering nighttime felony, they won't get a job at Walmart when they're 40. It's hard. So you don't want to do that. So we sometimes continue those cases without a fine and we put them into a significant... By the way, they've already tasted jail, and you can't tell that by looking at their record. That we put them into a very intensive program. They have been in jail long enough so that they're away from the drug, they're medically detoxed, and then what we do, I know I'm running out of time, and then what we do is we put them into a program funded by the legislature called Reflections in New Bedford. Well-run, 90-day program. If you bought this on your MasterCard, you would pay $900 a day. Um, they, it's, it's, it's a fabulous program. They get treatment. They get um, skill sets to learn how to stay sober. They then leave that program. Sometimes they go into a second program, paid for by the state. Um, Sometimes not. Sometimes if they come out of that program, they go right into drug court. The drug court is 120 days. They have to be sober and clean. We test them all the time. They, are, um, they report to the OCC Center in North Plymouth. They do community service. They get their GED if they haven't got a high school diploma. They, we give them occupational training and get them back to work. We're testing, testing, testing. They have to come and deal with me every two weeks in drug court and they have to hear what goes on with other folks, and a lot of folks get taken off the floor if they have violated their probation. So it's powerful. I invite you to come. Two days a month. We do two Fridays a month drug court. Um, it's going to happen this Friday, and it's going to happen two Fridays from now. I can't remember the date. But it might be worth your while to come and watch, even if you stay for 10 minutes, because it's up in session E in the courthouse, and it's, uh, it's a powerful, powerful session. A lot of parents go. Um, and we've had great success. And here's the good news. I mean, this, this conversation about why do we do this? Why do we give these kids Narcan? And why do we treat them? And why are we spending money? Because it works. And they live. To, they live to tell the story. And they survive it. And some of them really get clean and stay clean and move on with, with lives that are, that are fruitful. And so the good news is that there is treatment and that the courts are coming up to speed rapidly. This year there'll be 10 new courts coming online. The governor has um, proposed the budget. I believe it has quite a bit of uh, support in the legislature. You're going to see specialty courts popping up all over the place. And this is going to target this particular population. So Plymouth was um, one of the early ones for drug court. Yeah, we, we did. And we're hoping um, that there'll be more of them all over this one. In Barnstable, there's, uh, there's one in Quincy. So I think you'll see more of those. So that's what drug court is. It's, um, I think we could call it something else, recovery court, I suppose we could call it recovery court, I don't know, but it, it is a, it is a evidence-based model that we know works, and we try to use the best tools we have in the shed to deal with those kids that are addicted. So who is the heroin addict now? It used to be, what, 20, 30 years ago, that person who stepped over when you were in Boston, and, you know, it's like, well, this, who is, it is our kids, it is, uh, it is our sisters and brothers and kids. Um, these are good kids that got um, somehow introduced to a very powerful narcotic and they lost their control over it. So um, I don't know if I left anything out. I probably have given you more information than you can probably assimilate in one night. Um, but I will tell you that um, I think we have great uh, success with our partners. Um, with the police um, and the defense bar. By the way, all of, you know, once in a while cases get suppressed and drugs are, you know, there's a, there's a, there may be a drug seizure and then it's suppressed. You know, again, overarching everything we do in that courthouse is the Constitution and due process. That has to happen all the time. Um, but within that model of a constitutional protection that people's rights are protected, including their Fourth Amendment rights and their Sixth Amendment rights and their First Amendment rights, we do provide tremendous treatment. Most of the kids in drug court ask to get in there. Um, and I have kids coming in that courthouse all day long that are saying, I want treatment, I want help. I once had, I recently had two kids bring another one in and sort of pushed him forward and said, he wants to do a voluntary 35 judge. <laughs> because we told him that's how he's going to survive. We went to reflections and they left. So, I mean, I think the kids get it too. And that, movie that the kids here produced is fabulous. If you haven't seen it, please look at it. These kids did a, did a, a grand slam job on that, on that production.
So I think I'm done. Um, <laughs> Next seven hours, we're just going to have Rose do it. I'll tell you, she's an extraordinary leader of this very difficult issue. And uh, I went over to her chambers a month ago for a quick cup of coffee, and two and a half hours later, I, I understood that there's hope. There really is hope. Those were you You know, when our kids would go to court in the day, you think that's the end of the road. Now we know it's not the end of the road. I want to talk to you very briefly about this, uh, but before I go, I want to talk about Spice just for a second. Spice you can find on shelves in variety stores. It's labeled um, as a, um, a food plant, so, uh, a plant food. It's labeled as an incense. It's 500 times stronger, more potent than marijuana. Kids can buy it in variety stores. Uh, due to the leadership of my friend Alan Foley from Middleborough, selecting Alan Foley, uh, he, in his town, outlawed the sale of spice to anyone under 18 and in any uh, establishment where you serve food. So I brought that to my head five times, including Plymouth, and the boards of health are working on uh, banning them from the shelves of your town as well. So that's one of the challenges. Your Troy, I appreciate what you did to bring us before your board. And Belinda, thank Ken, all of you, thank you so much. Um, I want to very quickly talk about this, and then we're going to show a film, and we're going to open it up to your questions. And I know we're going long. If the panelists will uh, indulge us, uh, we will still answer your questions as long as they can stay and you're interested in us staying. Uh, people often say to me, why don't we just go and take the drugs out of the hands of the dealers and the problem solve? We don't know where the drill dealers are. I'd like you to think about a four-legged stool, because the solution to this problem has at least four components to it. And if you remove one of the legs, or one of the legs a week, you don't solve the whole problem. As we talked about, it begins at home, and it begins with open dialogue with your children. Uh, one thing that, for those of you who are young people, you want to do with your children is develop a code word. So when they're at a party and something's happening that they're not comfortable with, they can't pick up the phone and say to you, hey, there's smoking pot or they've got alcohol here or something's happening that I'm not comfortable with. So have a code word. You know, my strep throat is back. Some code word that they can say that you know you've got to come get them and everything's cool. The next thing is manage your medicine cabinet. Uh, monitor their social media. You pay for it. You have a right to look at it. You have a right to control it. The things they learn on Facebook, the things they learn on social media uh, would scare every one of you in this room. You have a right, don't try to be their best friend, be their parent. We talked about the schools and the need for resource officers. I ask you once again to join with me in getting a letter to leadership and send it to your friends and ask them to send it to their friends and let's make this viral that we get resource officers back in school. Uh, law enforcement and judicial. Uh, adequate police officers and detectives. We need to control the boundaries of our towns with detectives that will find and arrest the bad guys. Rosemary will agree with you. We don't want to put sick people in jail, but we want to get the dealers. We want to get the people that are profiting from this epidemic, and we do want to put them in jail. The last thing, community. Uh, we, we have to get back to the day, and I, as I at some of you, I know you remember that the, the social centers, the rocking centers would have in our communities. We have to give things, we have to give kids things to do so they're not hanging out in the woods or in the fields or behind the school. So those are the sorts of things we have to think about. If we do one or two of these things, we don't impact the epidemic. We have to do all four. So we have to support our schools, we have to support our police. I know it's expensive, nobody wants more taxes, but we are under attack and it's about time we responded to that attack with boots on the ground and, and resource officers in the schools. The last thing we're gonna do before we finish up uh, some of you may have seen it, some of you may not have seen it. Uh, there was a film made by the Plymouth Books of uh, several Plymouth North High School students about this very issue. It's a 13-minute film. We're going to show you a five-minute clip, and then we're going to wrap up for any questions you may have. So if we could run the clip, please. Plymouth, Massachusetts has been America's hometown for close to 400 years. This community that has passed the test of time is now being threatened by an encroaching enemy, illegal substances. Marijuana, hallucinogens, methamphetamine, and opiates 
are all creating an epidemic of addiction in our hometown's neighborhoods. Plymouth Public Schools and Plymouth Police are struggling to combat the viciousness and ruthlessness of drug abuse within its schools, students, friends, and families. But is it enough? Has the problem escalated beyond a simple cure? Addiction is a disease that is, isn't really classified as a disease. Like people don't understand exactly what that means when you say addiction is a disease. I lost a lot of close friends uh, of mine to addiction and overdose. Uh, my younger brother actually became addicted. He actually lost his battle uh, about like six months ago. To most people, it would be shocking to discover the wide variety of drugs that teenagers are getting their hands on. I mean, kids have come in laughs and told me that they've done everything from, you know, smoking weed or, or spice to uh, doing heroin. <laughs> Nothing that I think could tell me at this point would, would surprise me. Local community distributor, who goes by the name of Knockout, explains the reasoning behind selling controlled substances, specifically in the South Shore. Are the pills you're getting um, from your friends, are they pharmaceutical grade, or do you just have no idea where they're getting them from? They're getting them from hospitals. How do you get them from the hospitals? Um, I knew a person working at a hospital, and they uh, steal doctor's notes and fortune. Were they like a nurse, or just, you know, somebody cleaning in the office? Yeah, just a volunteer. Oh, just a volunteer, what? Not down in Plymouth, is it? Sure, it's awful. Plymouth North High School, a place where over a thousand students enter every day, is directly across the street from what has just been identified to be one of the many possible medical buildings in the area where people could be taking advantage of non-prescribed narcotics. Dr. James Finale of Jordan Hospital, now Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital of Plymouth, discussed these allegations. Some of these possible prescription pads get stolen, although now I will tell you prescription pads in hospitals are under lock and key for almost any, you don't see them laying around on the uh, desks anymore because of this kind of issue. Can't say it's perfect, but it's much more vigilant now than it's ever been. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, there's an explosion of synthetic opiate use in Plymouth County. Um, we are one of the highest usage areas in the country. Though Massachusetts ranks first in the country in amount of heroin overdoses and fifth in the country in marijuana use, with almost 15% of residents admitting to smoking pot. It ranks last in the country in amount of drug-related arrests. There is also a vast difference in amount of drug-related arrests from Massachusetts to the second lowest state on the poll, Hawaii, which is six times higher than our state and only one-third the population. Equally disturbing is how drug users and dealers perceive Massachusetts law enforcement's response to this situation. Do the cops notice that when people are under the influence of marijuana driving? Uh, some of them do, they can pick up on it. Um, a lot of them don't care though, like, as much as if it was a drunk driver. Like, every person I'm driven with how he's been caught has been let off the hook. Massachusetts is recognized as the state that the police probably have the least amount of power out of every other police department in the country. Just one example, when you pull over a car in Massachusetts, as compared to other parts in the country, at the federal level, a Texas cop could pull you over and immediately tell you to get out of the car. When that happens, when that person is at a disadvantage, drugs can fall out, they don't have time to move around in the vehicle. In Massachusetts, I cannot order somebody out of a car unless I feel that my life is in danger. That's just one example. I asked some of the participants to talk about how they became um, involved with heroin. And what was surprising even to me was that many of them said, I started on pills and I thought I could take a pill at a party and within about 18 months to two years, virtually every one of them was using intravenous heroin. Most popular in Plymouth and the South Shore is the use of prescription pills and heroin. Because prescription pills are so expensive, many addicts turn to a cheaper high, heroin. Heroin is so pure that it accounts for one death every eight days on the South Shore alone. An individual who lives on the South Shore is ten times more likely to die of an overdose than anywhere else in the country. I don't know, it's sad to see them like that. What it is is it usually starts with pills and then 
handle is more affordable and they can get their fix and cheaper so they go to that. It's a battle and I think uh, most of the folks upstairs uh, that we see in drug court very much want to stop and their families want them to stop and they're, they come in the building here and a lot of them kids that are in their teens and some of their friends bring them in and say, uh, they say I'm sick and I need help. Unfortunately, many people know an addict or suffer themselves from substance abuse. While it may appear as the social norm to experiment with drugs, too often it becomes a destructive regularity which leads to the abuse of illegal substances. We as a community need to make the right decision and help one another. Reporting for PNN, I'm Pat Fay.